So just start our What's Out There Day for Aspire with the theme being the mindset of living with a spinal cord injury. So I'll be facilitating. My name's Antonio. I'm one of the Spire mentors. Um, and I guess just some housekeeping that we do want to make this as interactive as possible. So for anyone out there listening, there is a Q&A function that if you just want to type in any questions, um, we will get them live and we can address them as we see them um, verbally, but we'll try and type responses to that there as well. So we'll go around and we'll introduce the panel members initially. So initially what I want the, the big theme of today is talking about adjustment of living with a spinal injury. So if I could get the panel members to talk a little bit about their life pre-injury and sort of what they've done afterwards as well as what they're doing now. So I'll start, I'll just go around my screen here. So I'll start with Josh. Uh, if you just want to give us a bit of introduction about yourself, please. No worries, mate. Um, so yeah, I'm Josh, I'm a peer support worker at AQA. Um, I had my injury back in 2005 and pretty much I just had finished BCE. So I was living in Camperdown, a smaller country town in Southwest Victoria. Um, I just played uh, different sports and then yeah, I had my injury on the stray day. And then um, I was there at the Royal Talbot and then I went back home for about two years. Uh, doing various rehab and then I, I got into wheelchair rugby and then pretty much fast forward 10 years uh, I retired from that sport and then joined AQA which brings me here today Vecchio. Thank you. Hose? Uh, Josh, sorry. Um, yes. So next we've got Catherine. Hi. Um, I had my accident when I was 19 in 2008. I was working as a track work rider at Stablehand and intending to be a jockey. Um, since then, I went back to school. I went back and did year 11 and 12 and then spent a few years playing wheelchair basketball and traveling and focusing on that. Um, the last, five six years I've been back in Tassie which is where I am now and my husband and I have a farm where we breed Angus cattle and we have miniature goats and we also have two small children Will who's four and Harry who is uh, coming up to two so that keeps me pretty busy and I also study part-time at UTAS at the moment as well. Thank you Catherine just before we continue the introductions um, for also anyone out there watching and listening there is a raise the hand function in zoom as well so if you do want to ask a question um, just hit that button and we can acknowledge that um, you have a question to ask so next um, is Sal Hosking so Sal doesn't have a spinal injury but she works at the spinal cord service so I might get you to introduce yourself Sal Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Sal, and I work on the Spinal Community Integration Service at Royal Talbot. Um, a little bit, I guess, about me. Um, I come from a background in working in mental health for quite a long time um, and have mainly worked with young people up until taking on the current role at Talbot. Um, I guess my interest, though, was to really come back to a setting that I was familiar with. I myself um, was a patient there in these um, after an MVA. So I spent quite a lot of time amongst the setting of, um, of rehab and really have enjoyed actually coming back to just be amongst it again and working with people and supporting people going through their own transitions and adjustments. So yeah, that's a little bit about me. And I've done a lot of work with Ant of late, which has been great. So um, yeah. Uh, it has been great, um, really informative for myself as well. Um, so next we have Lynn Paniotis. Hi everyone, my name's Lynn. Uh, along with Sal Hosking, I also work for the Spinal Community Integration Service at the Austin. I'm a peer support worker, so like yourself, I do have a spinal cord injury. 
Uh, pre uh, injury, I was a high school teacher. I was um, heading up the, the rank of um, a promotion, so I was up at uh, assistant principal level. After my injury, I did attempt uh, returning to the classroom, um, but found that very difficult due to the fatigue I was feeling and the whole bladder bowel routine thing. Um, I was also uh, a keen gardener, particularly vegetable gardener. I camped a lot. Uh, I was very social with uh, family and friends. And since my injury, um, I still garden. I, so I've got a, a raised veggie garden in the back. I've played basketball with Catherine, had a go at diving and, and, and snow skiing. Uh, and I'm also a great aunt in both meanings of the word. Nice. Thanks, Thank you. All right, so next we've got Jeff. Hi there, um, I'm Jeff and uh, I used to be a professional hang glider pilot and traveled the world and flew comps and, and I taught people how to fly and, and earned most of my living taking people for tandem flights in New Zealand, in Queenstown. And uh, uh, I was going really well and uh, everything was hunky dory until I had a bit of a complacent episode coming into land one day on a sort of fairly standard landing and uh, my passenger's arm swung through and broke my neck pretty high up C45 and uh, yeah life changed pretty suddenly and uh, I had a seven week year old daughter and a couple of older stepdaughters and uh, in the meantime uh, I I broke up with my wife and uh, I ended up having my six year old daughter living with me. So I came back to Australia where all my family are from. I'm from Melbourne originally. And, uh, um, and yeah, I raised my daughter. She's now 19 and she's doing really well, finished school and, and uh, having a gap year. She's actually in New Zealand um, cleaning at a backpackers and, uh, and paying her board that way and meeting lots of other young travelers. So I'm pretty happy that she's not here in Melbourne in lockdown. And, uh, and I feel, I really feel for the people who are in hospital at the moment with a new spinal cord injury, having to deal with the injury at the same time as COVID. So good. Um, yeah, you gotta be pretty resilient to get through that. So good on you. And, uh, and, now I'm, I'm, I've reinvented myself. I'm a mouth painting artist and uh, I do a bit of that uh, when, I, when I get motivated and the rest of the time I've been procrastinating through COVID. Sounds good. Um, all right, now we, next we've got Pete from AQA. Hello everybody, I'm Peter Van Bedford from AQA. Um, I had my injury in 1999 when I was 30, um, I used to be an electrician and very busy um, within the working as a contractor. So I was always really, really busy, busy, flat out. And um, I'm sort of glad that busyness has stopped. But um, after my, when I had my injury, uh, motorbike versus tree, um, I won. I'm still alive, the tree is not. And uh, I had a six week old son and a partner at that time, still do. If my son is now 21, still with the same partner. And um, shortly after I left rehab, I engaged in um, IT courses and then did certificate for disability and working with AQA, got more into the peer support and community type events and doing things which I really enjoy with Maz and Josh and Lynn and Sal and other people and get to meet great people. Um, my son now is an electrician so he's pulling me slowly into his business and helping him with all sorts of things. Also really like um, my retro furniture and, and cars. So I always enjoy picking up an old car and working on it as a hobby or my gardening. I love gardening and a veggie patch and doing things. And uh, so I always like to keep fairly busy, but balance that in life, of course, and enjoy time as well. Yeah. Awesome. 
Thank you, Pete. Uh, so next we've got Sally. Hey everyone. Um, I had my accident uh, five years ago in 2015. Um, and so at that time I was uh, 19. I was in my second year of university um, studying psychology. Uh, I enjoyed traveling and just sort of being an average 19 year old going out a lot. Um, and I was living at home with my family. Uh, and then since then, since having my accident after a period of adjustment, I've gone back to uni. I'm now doing a PhD in psychology. Uh, and I recently moved out of home with my partner. So that's pretty much me. Awesome. Last but not least, uh, Naz from AQA. Thank you, Antonio. Yep, last but not least. Well, I had a diving accident, um, just being silly at the beach. It's my mates one day. Um, got a C6 complete injury. At the time, I was working at GMH Holden and also as a truck driver as well. And after my rehab, went home for a couple of years didn't really do anything and that sort of spurred me on to sort of look at myself and, um, you know, realise that I could be doing and I should be doing a lot more than I was. And ever since then, I went back to school, got back into sport and worked for AQA Victoria now doing some peer sport at the Royal Talbot. Uh, of course, we haven't been able to do that for a few months, but yeah, it's all good. Awesome. Well, thank you for that, everyone. Um, I guess where we want to start this conversation is obviously the initial period of having your injury. Um, would anyone be willing to share, I guess, the initial thought process of obviously none of us plans to have our injury, but their initial feelings, the initial thought process of being told that, look, you've got a spinal cord injury, that period of uncertainty around having an injury um, and I guess how you felt, because it's going to be different for all of us um, of how you felt initially, um, if anyone's willing to share. I can start off if you want, Antonio. Yeah, so um, I, I realised, of course, as you do, something serious was uh, wrong with my body. I wasn't able to move, of course. You know, that was a good hint that something major was wrong. And I remember the first time uh, I was told by a doctor what the situation was. Um, he came straight out and he said, you've broken your neck, you've got a spinal cord injury and you'll never be able to walk again. So pretty much straight out like that. And I was okay because I had a few couple of weeks to think about it. And I thought to myself, well, you know, I think it was a little bit too straightforward. So I took it okay. Others that would have been doing it tough or tougher than I was, they would have even um, you know, put themselves in a worse position. But I remember when I was going through rehab, I saw people that would, were readmitted to hospital with pressure sores and all that. So I didn't realise, of course, they were readmitted. There are a couple of people I saw um, on what they call prone trolley. So that's like a bed that you lay on and with your chest um, to the base of the bed and you can push yourself around like a wheelchair. And I thought, oh no, you know, is that going to be my life now? You know, that's, I'm going to be getting around like that. Um, but I saw those guys, they weren't, they didn't seem unhappy. Some of them were reading books and watching TV in that situation. And I thought that's what my life was going to look like, you know, for the rest of my life. But then I realised that wasn't the case. You know, these people had had not been looking after themselves as well as they should have been, and they were back recovering from pressure sores, which is a major issue as well. And um, since then, of course, I I sort of developed and gained knowledge about the possibilities, and seeing people go into the rehab unit to offer peer support, and that was ma massive for me. You know, I was able to see that life can be uh, on a normal again, in a way. Awesome, thank you. Now, Catherine, did you want to go next? Sure. Um, so I was told fairly early as well that, um, that I had a spinal cord injury and that I wouldn't walk. Um, and, and just quite frankly, didn't really believe them and just went, well, I'll prove them wrong sort of thing. 
And then um, it wasn't until sort of probably about three weeks later that um, Dr. Nunn actually sat me down and explained exactly how the spinal cord worked and how mine was damaged. And I went, okay, yep, I see the problem. Um, the good thing about having that sort of few weeks there where I thought that I was going to be okay was it actually gave me a chance to start seeing those little improvements on a day to day that meant that I could see that, okay, yeah, this isn't where I'm going to be forever and I am going to get a lot better. So for me, um, my own just naivety kind of helped me um, to get a little bit of a step up and it wasn't such a shock. Um, by the time that I actually worked out what was going on, I'd, um, I'd had a chance to sort of process it a little bit. So. Yeah, it's definitely an interesting point you make that you say, oh, like knowledge of the injury, like we've all got spinal injuries and, you know, Sal has worked with people with spinal injuries that we're all now so aware of our injuries, but at an initial time, not knowing like the detail of a spinal cord injury um, and obviously then having to educate ourselves. Um, does anyone, I guess, that want to share their range of emotions? Um, so the emotional side, if they're willing to share that? Yeah, I don't mind adding a bit there. Um, when I had my injury, I was, I'm a C4 quad, quad, which I didn't mention before in my introduction, but um, when I first had my injury um, for the first couple of months, I really had very limited movement. So I pretty much knew that and didn't think that I was going to get much movement or much ability. Um, and I was pretty fearful that I wouldn't have much opportunity in life or much opportunity to do things. I didn't I couldn't imagine that, you know, having a spinal cord injury and living in the future or what I would be doing in the future. It was pretty tough for me to get my head around that and think about that. And probably a lot of denial went into that too, where I didn't want to think about that. You know, while I was in rehab in hospital, I just sort of shut myself down a bit and um, just lived for the day, you know, and not um, didn't think about the future because I didn't know what that was going to be until I spoke to other people around me who had spinal cord injuries and started to get an idea. But it still was hard for me to imagine or how I would do because I was trade-based and electrician and very active and um, a sports person. I didn't know what all that was going to be for me. But, you know, you slowly navigate through that and start to do things and start to find a way through that. And it's um, not until you do that, you can, you'll never know until you give it a go type of thing. Yeah. But that was an issue pretty hard for me. Yeah. I think that's the nice thing about Talbot actually is the fact that because you're all at different stages and everyone's got different injuries is you are always surrounded by other people. There's almost always someone who's got it a little bit tougher and in this further, has got further to go still than you do. But there's also always people around who have been where you've been and have actually, and are a lot further down the road. And so you, you can kind of see where you're heading from that point of view, as well as people like Pete, who have been in chairs for a long time. I mean, you were in Talbot, I think working when I had my my injury. So um, yeah, people who, who come back and are able to sort of show us what we've got to look forward to. Yeah. I mean, just through conversation, talking to people, um, what they did on the weekend, or how they pushed their chair or drove their electrical chair, just those little tips and things that really helped me build up how I thought I could do it, you know, but initially I couldn't see that lot, how I could do that, you know, and that was, that was um, concerning for me at the start. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a, sorry, I think that's a big part of, of um, of adjusting to it and I think that's why it can often take a lot longer than you think to adjust to, to post you know accident kind of life is is because I think I've definitely went into it not knowing anyone with a disability or not knowing anyone in a wheelchair so I had no idea what it meant to suddenly be disabled or suddenly be paraplegic or what I could do or what sort of person I could be afterwards so I think it took me a long time to integrate my identity before and being disabled and, and just the practical side of stuff of like, what can I actually do? What can I expect to be able to achieve now? So I think giving yourself time and actually learning about what does it mean to be in a wheelchair or, and, and 
and being around other people, you know, in the community is really helpful. And going into it open-mindedly with, you know, because a lot of the portrayals of people in wheelchairs that you get from the media aren't always accurate. So when you actually learn about real life people, it can be a lot more helpful. Yeah, and that's probably, it's a really good point there. That's something that is important that a lot of us may have not been exposed to people with disabilities, but also having preconceived ideas of how people with disabilities live their life um, as well. And I think that's a really important thing because you think, oh, well, that uncertainty around living with a disability. And none of us, you know, Pete sort of mentioned that he wasn't sure and Nas as well, wasn't sure what life would hold. Um, I guess moving on from that, I guess once we got that little bit of information, we've, we've had to deal with the fact that we've had an injury. Go, and this is all going to be different again, going through the grief stages and processing the injury as well. So was there, like I said, that range of emotions? Was anyone here sort of angry or uncertain? Did, um, is anyone willing to share, I guess, that emotional roller coaster of that initial stage of, not necessarily initial, but that process of coming to terms with it? Yeah, if I'll go, Nick, yeah. Because yep. um, the one thing I found was, um, you know, from I, I was in an induced coma, so when I actually came out, I couldn't really speak and uh, know what was actually going on. And I actually heard the doctor speak to my father that I wouldn't be able to walk again. And so, you know, not being able to articulate, I guess, my frustrations and, um, and you know, asking questions, that was a hard process. And then to your point, I guess, you know, that whole journey, going back home, I think, was quite... Um, sobering because you have all these thoughts coming back of what you used to have and what you don't have now so i think that that part in particular was um confronting in a way because uh you know i was young 18 year old and i guess i hadn't really established what i was going to do with my life so it was sort of feeling it out and um working out what that was going to look like for me and to what sally said earlier you know um i went back to the small country town where it was myself and one other that was in a wheelchair. So um, it wasn't until when I moved back then to Melbourne, surrounded myself with other individuals, um, knowing what was sort of possible. So Lynn, you wanted to go next? Yeah, in terms of the, the grief and getting over things, I found that I was overwhelmed with the grief and that I needed to, it's not that I chose to do it this way, but I, I would deal with, different things over time. So um, initially it was all about the, the funeral for my husband. Um, I never ever thought about being paraplegic. I remember years later, uh, it's probably five years later that I was transferring from my commode onto the bed and, and I have a mirrored wardrobe and I look and I saw my amputated leg and I, you know, just fell into, burst into tears. And so that was grieving for the leg I lost. And, and then there was the, um, the not being able to teach again. Uh, and then there was that could, I never spent um, another night in my own home. So it was, it was a very long process. And in, in some ways it, it's still continuing that every now and again, of course, it's getting fewer and pure, but every now and again, I'll hear someone say something or I'll see something on TV um, and it'll just spark that, spark that twang of, uh, I used to do that or I really enjoy doing that and I can't do that anymore. Um, and so the, for me, the grief process has been little bits over a long time because I wasn't able to do all of it at once. It was too much. Definitely. Um, and I guess part of that, and Catherine sort of touched on it a little bit, that when is it, I'll throw this to the panel, when is it that the sort of reality of the injury started to settle in for you guys? Like, you know, was it a few weeks? Did, you know, sometimes it takes people, once they leave Talbot, so Josh mentioned going back to the country town. So when was it that I guess the reality of living with an injury and the permanent state of it um, started to kick in for some of you guys. 
I mean, for me, that was, um, you know, when I was at Talbot, you know, a lot was done for me. Uh, I had all the services at my fingertips and um, even though I didn't feel like I was going fast, my rehab and everything, it sort of was, but the big sort of daunting place probably when I got home and that first day that I was home and I, I moved into a new house that day or rental um, with my partner and my son and it was just that big day of, okay, now I'm here and I've taken so many steps to get to that, to that home base, you know, and I remember putting that all behind me and um, and some of it was really big. You know, just the little things that I needed to get over and goals to get home. But when I first got home, I I remember I had a, my wife said, come on, let's go put your car in. We're going to get rid of things that we don't need. And I don't know if I was quite ready for that, but I threw away a lot of my old clothes, my going out clothes, my, uh, you know, diff different bits and pieces I wouldn't use no more. And I also had that huge mountain of things to take on. You know, my funding body, um, all those things that, you know, the care plan, carers, all those things that I had to take on, which was a huge mountain for me to, to contemplate and start to tackle. And that was huge. And um, didn't want to do it, but, you know, it was hard. And, and I didn't want to sort of close the curtains and pull my head in. And I didn't want to get angry. I wanted to move on, but it was hard. I was stuck in limbo a bit, but after a week of that, I said, no, nope, that's it, I've got to move on, I've got to do the things I can, and that snowball got better and got bigger, and I ticked off all those boxes slowly and, and got rid of that map of things I had to get rid of and, and start to function as a person with a disability in society, you know, and showed myself I could do it, you know, and you could see that light at the end of the tunnel. Mm. Sally, you were going to add something more? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say to to build up what Peter and, and what Lynn said earlier about grief is it's it's all a non-linear process I think and it it takes a lot longer than you think because it's not like like I I tend I tended to think when I was in rehab that once I got out of rehab it was going to be like that was that was the end goal get out of rehab and then life is back to normal you you're living at home but that was the start of the journey that was the start of you know of everything and I think. Yeah, readjusting your expectations to a longer time scale can be helpful because it's it doesn't end when you when you get home. That's that's the, the start of adjusting to being at home. That's a whole nother challenge. And and you have the little wins along the way, but it, it takes a while to get there. Um, and it's it's good to do it in parts as well. You, you're not gonna fix everything or get used to everything in, in a few weeks. So it's, it's a lot, it's a big pile of stuff to get used to. Yeah, and the point with that as well, um, although we all, I guess, have that common bond of having a spinal injury, we're all individuals as well. And the way we process our own grief is individual to us. I might just bring in Sal Hoskin here um, and just ask sort of, you know, part of what you do at the Spinal Cord Service there is helping people transition from rehab to the community. Is that where you find some of the greatest challenges in what you do? Just um, touching on some of the comments that have been made already, one of the biggest things for me when I'm working with people in our community is very much about listening to everyone's individual experiences. And I try and I guess promote that amongst our staff as well at Talbot and Austin, because as some of you have mentioned, like, you know, Lynn and Sally, you've mentioned that whole experience of everyone does it at their, that needs to do it at their own pace and everyone's experience is different. So I think if as people in my role or other roles in therapy can be mindful of that and aware of that, that we need to be there and respect each person as they come through and work with them at their pace that's a really important way, I think, of supporting someone to establish that sense of safety and trust that, that they need to develop with us to support them through that, that initial part of their journey and to get them back into life and community. So, um, and another point that I think I try and also talk to and promote amongst where I am at work is that people come to us at this point in their life, but everyone's had life before and will have life after they leave our service. So 
it's one part of, of a life. <laughs> so that means that they come to us with experiences and their, um, their own previous stuff as well. So I guess they're just some of the things that I try and be very aware of and mindful of and respectful of actually when I'm supporting people through that initial part of the transition. Awesome, thank you. Um, and just, I guess, part of that dealing with reality is something that gets spoken a lot to me about when I'm in mentoring is hope and what hope looks like for different people. And obviously that initial, I guess, intention, that initial um, idea of recovery is hope of walking. Um, and when the reality sits in that that may not be the case. Um, I guess, does anyone want to share their thoughts? Because that's a natural feeling, I think, that we've paralysed and we want to walk again, um, but that's not always possible. How did you, how did anyone here, I guess, deal with that hope? And then move, shifting that hope from walking to other goals moving forward. I think it's hard, uh, it's hard early on, Becca, because you know, I, for myself, my personal situation, I had a bit of feeling, so I always thought it was going to get better. And, um, and I, I don't think there's any, any actual particular point you can pick where it actually shifts. But, and like uh, Sally mentioned, it's non-linear. I like that because there's different parts that you go. You want to walk and then my, I guess my attention focuses to, for myself in particular, doing a transfer. And then it might have been put my socks on. And I guess the hope sort of shifts slightly throughout that journey. So it's a re part of what you're saying, though, I guess, is goal setting as well. So when you're in rehab, did you set like did you set yourself goals? And also, just touching on what Sally said as well, that when she left rehab, it was a whole new bunch of challenges. I guess maybe Sally, um, I guess after Josh, if you could elaborate on, did you set yourself tasks, goals, different things that you had yeah. to reevaluate once you were back in the community out of rehab as well? Yeah, I think you touched on a really good point there because in, in rehab, it is very goal oriented. You're learning to transfer, you're learning to get your socks on, do whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's, that kind of drives you forward and gives you kind of proof of like, I'm getting towards the end goal. And then you go home and you're kind of not surrounded with those people that are telling you, you need to go to physio, you need to do this. Uh, and so it can be easy to kind of lose track of things of, of what you're trying to do. And so I think setting yourself some goals, like my goal, once I got home was I want to get back to uni and that kind of was a was a good driver for me but it wasn't as intense as being in in rehab but it was useful so using using something to give yourself a reason to keep working on stuff and keep just doing stuff and driving yourself forward i think that's that was helpful for me definitely goals are yeah. very important no definitely and but also and i'll throw this as well sort of having that large goal so sally says going to uni how how is it that did you break down, did people break down that goals to sort of little things? So rather than saying this, hmm. oh, I want to get back to work or, you know, Josh had aspirations to be an athlete. Did you then break that down? Did you find that, that really helped sort of achieving those goals? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Because, yeah, going back to uni was obviously a big ambiguous goal. How do I possibly go about doing that? But yeah, breaking down into small steps and, and also asking for help along the way. I remember I, I wanted to go back to my uni campus. I, went, I go to Melbourne University in the city and I was so intimidated by going alone to university. I, I asked one of my friends to come with me the first day and just walk around campus and just like see where all the ramps can I get to all my classes. But asking for help was, yeah, very useful because it's difficult to do all these things alone. Definitely. Now, I guess I might just ask yourself, Jeff, you obviously lived a pretty active lifestyle before. How did you reevaluate your goals afterwards? So you say you got into the painting. Was that a goal you set yourself or was that something that you sort of fell into? I probably fell into it more than anything. I, um, I couldn't move anything when I first had my accident. I was, couldn't, except I could turn my head a bit when I wasn't in the brace, but that was about it. And uh, I, um, I always thought that I would be able to recover quite a lot, but the doctors kept on telling me otherwise. But uh, I guess I, I fought against what they were saying and uh, 
I traveled to the U S and did some rehab over there. And, uh, um, and I did, even though I didn't get to walk myself, I did get a lot of things returned through just forcing myself to do things like, um, my right arm couldn't do anything um, for a long time. And it was only because I switched the, uh, the joystick from the left to the right of my wheelchair and forced myself to, to actually do something that I actually got strength back in my right arm. Previously the left was the only one that did anything and gradually little things came back just uh, through being pig headed, I suppose. And, uh, and, and then, um, you know, I got to a point where no matter how much physio and, and rehab stuff I tried, I was just spending hours and hours and hours and not seeing a great deal of improvement. And I've, probably sort of relaxed a lot since then and maybe I could have got more back but uh, I've sort of become a bit more content with how I am and uh, and then I started thinking about other things and I tried to keep my business going for a number of years but it was just too difficult without me being able to do what I used to do the same way uh, and uh, I knew a few artists um, around Queenstown um, one of them was in a wheelchair, but um, they sort of gave me an idea about what I could do. And I I bought cards from the mouth and foot painting artists in the mail previous to my accident. And, and I started, I met a guy who was actually a student member of the mouth and foot painting artists and had a look at his art, artwork and thought, oh, well, I could do something like that and uh, had a go and was fortunate enough to get a scholarship and and went from there so um yeah it's um i found it very difficult um because i was a very independent person prior to my accident uh having to ask for help and uh i think um sometimes you know it just saves a lot of time asking for help and i just say yeah okay i'll ask but um I try to do things when I can. But, um, there's a lot of uh, things you have to uh, adjust to, but yeah, things can get better. Awesome. And Lynn, you wanted to add something on walking? So my injury is quite low and I have, um, my hamstrings have uh, are fairly weak, but my quads are reasonably strong. And so I had the potential to be able to walk. So even within rehab, I did some standing. And then I spent uh, oh, at least the next three years at a community rehab. And between um, the land-based physio, the aquatic physio, because of my amputation, I needed prosthetic. Um, I also needed full length, both, both legs, Full calipers to be able to uh, to be able to be walk, and they constantly needed uh, readjusting. And so, I could walk in the sense that I could stand. Um, I needed a, f uh, a decent sized um, walking frame. So, if you've ever seen one that people with uh, Parkinson's used, it's it's in a U shape. It's got about uh, oh, six six or eight casters rather than the two or the four in the smaller um, walking frames. So I could walk, but I couldn't do anything. I had to hold my entire body weight through my arms um, because I didn't have any bum muscles. I wasn't able to push my, my bum or my hips forward and get my shoulders far enough back so that I could um, balance and use uh, walking sticks, which is what I was trying to do. And uh, like Jeff was saying, I spent so much time, it's all I did. And I felt like I was trying to be an elite athlete. I was, for, if, I, I was if I wasn't exercising, I was with therapists. And I eventually realized that it wasn't very functional for me. Um, I could stand, but once I was standing, I couldn't do anything like make myself a, a cup of tea. Uh, it was very slow. 
It was um, very time consuming to put them on and off. I couldn't uh, get in the car and then get out easily if I had them on. I also realized that uh, it was causing me an awful lot of, um, of pain through, uh, through my right hip. And so much to my mother's disgust, uh, I decided not to continue trying to walk and I gave that away and decided it was faster, easier and less stressful if I just stayed in the chair. And so that's what I did. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Lynn, um, I guess something that, we, we, you know, obviously there's the physical side of the traumas that we've been through. Something I've spent a lot of time looking into over the last couple of years is the emotional side, the, um, I guess, mental side of what we've gone through um, and how that affects us. So obviously things like um, dealing, like dealing with the injury, did you feel, did anyone here feel that it changed the way, like if we had a bad day and we were angry, angry, we took it out on someone? And did it change our, like not change our personality, but change the way we interacted with people? Did we isolate ourselves? Were we anxious to go out? So I know Sally, you mentioned about, you know, before you went to uni, you're a bit unsure about sort of going out. And there was, I guess, a bit of trepidation towards that. Um, things like depression, um, you know, things like, did you isolate yourself without knowing? So were there changes in the way you lived your life without understanding, without you knowing them or you weren't aware that they were happening? So, Catherine? Um, I found that um, I noticed very quickly that people tended to ignore me and speak to the people that were around me. Um, as and generally in society, we just don't know what to do with people in wheelchairs. And so people would just ignore me and talk to my mum or um, my boyfriend at the time or whatever. So I found it actually, I got to a point where I was I didn't understand. Sorry? No, go on, sorry. Um, where I realised that either I was going to have to deal with people just not ever talking to me for the rest of my life or I was going to have to do something about it. And it actually made me really assertive. So um, if we're even now, if we go out for dinner and I'm out with my husband and friends or whatever, um, I am the one who goes straight to the waiter or the waitress and I'll be the one asking for the table and... Um, I just sort of take control of the situation so that those people who are sitting there going, okay, I don't know if I can talk to her, like, and just being really unsure of how to handle me, I don't give them a chance to do that. Um, and that's been the way that I've dealt with that has been, I just throw them in the deep end and they can come with me. So. I've had a really similar experience, Catherine, actually, of, of initially being, I was quite, uh, nervous about going out and interacting with people from the position of being in a wheelchair because that was so such a foreign idea and i at first was really just anxious and unsure of myself and i think the thing was that that made other people around me really anxious and unsure of how to interact with me and the biggest lesson that i learned and it took me a really long time to get here was the more assertive i was and the more sure of myself i was the more that put other people at ease and they were like oh everything's fine i can interact with this person like a normal person because I was interacting like a normal person. I wasn't being sort of anxious and unsure of myself and, you know, all of that. I think the other thing that goes with that is um, people just quite often will assume that someone in a wheelchair has um, some sort of intellectual disability as well and therefore they don't know um, how to interact with us from that point of view, whereas you don't have to talk to me for very long to know that, um, that that's not an issue that that I'm dealing with. So, um, yeah, I think that that kind of takes that question out of the situation as well when we are more assertive um, and take control of the situation. Then well, I found that, um, I don't know if people think that we've got anything wrong with us. In our mind, I just think that sometimes people just don't know how, how to approach 
or I haven't spoken to someone in a wheelchair before, so they might be just a bit unsure, or don't want to say the wrong thing, or don't want to offend, so there's just that bit of a hesitation before that. So when you break that ice, and you start speaking to that person, and they see that you just talk only, and you want to order a meal, or you want to have bunnies, or whatever that is, it just helps to break that ice and to move forward, rather than leaving in that little bit of a area of how to, how do I start this conversation? Yeah, so I really get what you people are saying, and it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. I certainly don't think it's people being um, deliberately awful. I think just so many of us haven't um, haven't had very many interactions with people with disabilities, so it makes we just don't know. And that's something I often say that as well that I sort of go. I obviously live with a disability now. What was I like before my injury? And what interactions did I have with people with disabilities? And would I be one of those ignorant people? So it's like, uh, it's sort of, I used to get a lot more angry at it, where now it's like, you know what? I probably was going to be one of those people that didn't know a lot about disability. And the only reason I know a lot about disability is because I ended up having one. So, you know, that in itself is something that I've sort of um, been mindful of. Lynn, did you want to say something there? Or? Uh, yes, I, I was going to add uh, along Sally and Catherine's line of I always uh, try and make eye contact with people first. Um, I always smile um, and I'm usually the first to say hello. So I'll um, introduce, introduce myself. So uh, I, I would um, agree with Catherine in, in being assertive but polite. And I also agree with you, um, Antonio. I have two disabled sisters, but I would never have, and I still don't consider them disabled. And yet I do the same thing as you. Would I have done, you know, would have I offered to push someone across the road or up a hill? Absolutely. And so I know that that's the type of person I would have been, that if someone offers to push me and I say, no, thank you, I'm right, but they can't help themselves, then I just go, okay. It's not, go it's not the end of the world if someone pushes me up the hill. I'm being kind to them. Awesome. Yeah, I think, I think uh, uh, anybody with a spinal cord injury is gonna come up against regular problems. And uh, uh, at first, you you need help and uh but sometimes you can learn things well often you'll learn things that'll help you to be able to to solve the problem yourself and uh, uh the, some of the things that uh i get out and do every day now um i wouldn't have thought of i could even do it you know i i'm happy to jump on a train and go into the city um well obviously not at the moment but uh but you know, and, and go around to shops and, and go to a coffee shop and get them to stick a straw in my coffee cup. And, and I can do that sort of stuff. Whereas I, when I was first in the spinal unit in Christchurch in New Zealand, I, um, I went on my first outing to, to a shopping mall and I was terrified even uh, doing anything that was slightly, you know, out of my comfort zone. So you do learn a lot and uh and uh as as the others were saying you you, you do need to be conf confident in a way and and assert yourself um um but also it's, i think it's important to be polite to people who do offer to help and and say thanks and uh and try not to vent your frustrations on on uh anybody who's especially family and friends who are trying to help uh, to, and that's, I would think, a really important part of a mindset of living with a disability that um, it's important to acknowledge that not everyone has the knowledge that we have about disability. Um, moving forward, I guess, talking about, we've spoken a bit about goal settings, goal setting, what have you, I guess. Um, something that I'll once again throw to the panel is, other than goal setting, what sort of thing, and even in your everyday life now, what sort of um, coping mechanisms and structures do you put in to that helped you move forward with your disability? So other than setting goals, is there anything that sort of helped you 
and Lynn spoke about it, I guess, with her walking, is a point where that you just accepted it and moved forward, like a moment in your life where you said, you know what, it is what it is, or was it a gradual thing, or was there one thing in your life that said, it is what it is, I'm just going to move forward with the disability. So I guess a point of actually accepting it for what it was. But can I, um, I fell into wheelchair well, very early. And so, um, yeah, I was thrown into learning a new sport as well as surrounded by a whole heap of different women with all sorts of different disabilities. So, um, that gave me a whole different range of views anyway. But um, so because traveling with a, with a basketball team, um, everyone else was independent. So it kind of um, forced me into my independence a little, like I couldn't rely on other people so much and the, just the, the team environment and everything, so. Josh, I think, you were, oh, sorry. Can I just say, uh, I think it's important, even though I was saying earlier and, and others have said that they uh, learn to accept certain things, I think it's also important to fight against the system somewhat and uh, not always accept what people say is to be your lot and uh, to, you know, otherwise a lot of the things that are possible, you might ne never try to, ach to achieve. So... Yeah. Also, I think something that's important for especially people watching out there that um, are in Talbot or in rehabs, we've all had setbacks, as I guess, as part of our rehab and part of our adjustment. What sort of strategies do people come up with here of dealing with setbacks? You know, were some things harder than others to accept? Um, like, you know, let's talk, you know, for example, transferring in rehab, whatever. And what sort of coping mechanisms did you guys put in to deal with setbacks? Because I think that's a really important part of adjustment. I think you just, for me, I just, everything is, comes practically. You know, um, so if something doesn't work and I do have a setback, um, to be bogged down in that thought or to not, Think of a solution. I mean, not think of a solution. It's not. It's not logical for me. So, and and that holds me in that pattern. I don't want to. I've been in that pattern many many years ago. And you know, I'd rather think of a solution and to move forward. And then whatever did go wrong, whatever the setback was, I um, rule it out. I just forget about it. I have to. I have to let go, or else it will cling to me for the day, and it can ruin my day. So I don't want that to happen. Yeah. So. Yeah, for me, um, I really focused on the good things and perfecting those things and making my days better and my routine or um, new things I try don't always work out straight away, but it's more to focus on what does work and what, how I can make it work better. You know? And that doesn't happen instantaneously. Sometimes it might take months or you know, time, but it's about that practical approach for me. You know, what works and don't forget about what doesn't. Yeah. I guess the other thing with that as well, is there any has there ever been a setback for anyone on the panel that really got to them and stopped them moving forward? Like we all deal with setbacks, but was there ever anything that really sort of got to you and said, look, you know, whether going out in the first time, whether driving the first time, was there anything that really got to you? And then how you overcame that as well? Probably for me, um, was my bowel routine in the first year or two, um, I used to focus on it way too much. And um, I wasn't used to it and I couldn't tweak it right. And I'd have accidents or I'll, I wouldn't do enough bowels. And I was always concerned about, about that for the first year or so. And, and I realized I was doing myself no good about thinking about that. So, you know, I got other help to help me, you know, nurses, conscience nurses and doctors, and to smooth that all out and to think about it better. And um, I've never looked back since I've sort of thought about that a lot more and realised it was probably me affecting that a lot more and not getting, thinking about it completely and using medical or you know, the advice around me. So that was one thing that set me back for a while, um, my bowel routine. Mm. What else? 
on, on another level, Vic, and mine was in particular, I guess, um, to be like the bladder. And um, for those viewers out there, you can go to our YouTube channel and uh, review the bladder management that um, some of us went through. But um, for that, you know, if I went to go to a cafe with friends, you know, I was so annoyed, uh, paranoid, like, was it going to be a toilet that I could go to, to um, you know, to, you know, empty my bladder or, you know, go to a catheter or whatever it was. And because, um, you know, at that period of time, the amount of uh, volume I could hold was very low. So, you know, that was always in the, 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 the back of my mind. And then sometimes you think, oh, I can't go there with my friends. So it was limiting me in that way of, uh, you know, going out in the community. But on that, was there a point or was there a stage where, I guess it's a risk management thing. It's like, well, there's a chance of bladder bowel plane up and that's going to keep me home. Was there a point and a shift where you sort of said, me living with that risk is stopping me from doing something. Mm. I'd rather go out and risk it. Was there a point with that? Because I think that's something you know, that's uh, not yeah. uncommon. Because like I don't want to go out because of having an accident or whatever. When was it to anyone for, anyone for the panel? When was it that you overread that? It's like, look, I'll just live with the risk. Yeah, and that's a really good point. For me, it was just like, you know what? If it happens, it happens. You know, I'll just cut my day short and go home and take care of it. You know, and that never really did happen. It's just that it was so overwhelming for me, the thought of not doing enough or, you know, or building up over some. So, you know, once I knew what I was doing um, with my medication or anything like that, then I just let it settle and then I took the anxiousness out of it and it was a lot better for me. Yeah. And uh, I think for, to my experiences there, Becky, I was saying, you know, this. You know, I'm not happy with this and exploring other options. So that's, that leads back to your points before about setting goals. Okay, well, I'm not happy. What can I do to go about this? And that might be, you know, connecting with other individuals that are living with a spinal cord injury. In my particular case, going to the urologist, working out different ideas and uh, processes. It's funny, we just had a comment on the chat as well about the importance of, I guess, exposure to other people with spinal cord injuries and seeing what, um, I guess people living with the disability are doing and that's a real education thing like I know when I started playing rugby I saw people like Nas and other people that really helped me and you know Catherine mentioned basketball and what have you um, so obviously we're our own support network I guess the importance of friends family and developing support networks so I'm, I'm the first to admit that one of my biggest challenges was I isolated myself after my injury and I pushed everyone away and that was you know obviously with hindsight I look back and go that was a mistake but um, you know I guess the importance of connecting with people like I know Sally mentioned that she had friends that were able to help her when she went to uni um, I guess if people on the panel want to talk about the importance of having people around you um, and not isolating yourself. So like I often say to people, the mistake I made was isolating myself. I'll go back and change it. Um, does people want to share, I guess, or a similar experience like myself? I have a sort of tangential thing to just say about support networks is, um, I think uh, I didn't realize at first that I wasn't the only one going through my injury, that everyone around me was also going through something and they were having mm. to adjust to me being in a wheelchair. And I think, there's a tendency to get annoyed at your parents or your friends when they say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. But you have to realize like they don't know what to do. They, again, they might be like you. They're the only, you're the only person in a wheelchair they've had any interaction with. And, and everyone is different. Everyone has different preferences for when they want help or when they, how they like things to be talked about. So I think giving them space to adjust to it as well and, and having patience with people around you while they adjust is, is useful. Yeah. And if I could on that, something that, I've sort of said to people um, along those similar lines is people with chairs in with spinal injury say, well, our family members don't know what it's like for us to go through. And something that I've sort of said, it's like, well, we also don't know what it's like to be a family member of somebody going through a spinal injury. So we have our perspective, but you know, it's a really good point there, Sally, that the people around us are adjusting as well. And we need them to go through those stages, which is so important. Um, but yeah, like, so Josh, you said you went back to a community in Warrnambool. Did you find that the community there 
was supportive and did that help with, I guess, your rehab? I think to a degree, you know, I had a great family and um, small community support, but, you know, they only knew as much as they, they knew. And um, I think the major factor for me was uh, accessibility-wise, you know, um, you know, extremely hilly and um, the things that time for myself being a wheelchair, you know, pubs, um, sort of not the best in foot car, foot pass, my own wheelchair um, operational, you know, wheelchair skills and independence, they're all contributing factors, I think, that... Um, in the early stages were limiting me. Antonio, can I just add, you know, you talk about isolation and stuff like that. Um, I see that as being normal as well, because a lot of people do need that time to isolate themselves. They don't see it as isolation. It's just something that they need to do, you know. They, need, they feel like they need to step back. After I got discharged from rehab, um, I was at home for two years, not doing much at all. I would be reading the paper, you know, the Herald Sun from front to back every single day. I'd be watching TVs, you know, believe it or not, I used to watch Days of Our Lives and really got stuck into that. It's pretty sad to say now, but it was, it was enjoyable at the time. But after that two years, I thought to myself, is this, is this my life? You know, I could be doing so much more. So. I made some inquiries, you know, I went back to school, done some volunteer work, found a job, got into sport and everything snowballed from there. But that two years where I wasn't unhappy, um, but I wasn't doing anything. So I needed that time and, uh, you know, the outcome was pretty good. So after that, I feel, yeah, quite happy. I might just bring Sal Hoskin in here. I know that's some, this is a topic that you and I have spent a few hours talking about the whole adjustment period and the balance um, from, I guess, your point of view, working with people adjusting. Isolation is important, is important if that's a person's personality, but when does that isolation then become a problem, you know, that it's showing then signs of depression, anxiety. Um, so obviously it is different people grieve in different ways, but then is, when is that, I guess, starting to become a problem for people. Yeah, potentially. We, have, we have had some good combos about this because I think, again, it's, um, it's really dependent on the person. And um, a few of you have talked about that experience of before as well. So that whole thing around integrating and understanding your emotions and who you are now, you have been through such massive change. Um, and there's probably something out there that might not have even really given that emotional thought process stuff much thought at all, actually. So, um, which can be really confronting in itself. I know um, Auntie and I've talked about that in a sense of, for people that, you know, might not be that attuned to even their emotional stuff. And then suddenly this is all going on for them. So I think having the time to process that again at their own pace and, and some people do need to do that very privately. Um, and I think we need to respect that. Um, for some people, though, it's not always helpful. So, again, some people really need to have people around them to support them through that process. So, it's, a, again, a bit of a understanding where that person is at, understanding what they do actually need to get them through um, and listening from a point of view of someone in my role or in those roles around the person, it's really tuning in to the needs of that person um, and maybe not being afraid to ask some of those questions if you do have concern. And that, that could even be from a peer to peer perspective as well, you know, um, checking in if, if that person is traveling okay with where they're at with it and, some people might be saying that, yeah, some days are harder than others, but some people might actually be experiencing really extreme isolation and having to have big effects on their mood. And, and I guess that's when, from a point of view of adjustment, then we might start to consider, well, is this, is this within that person's norm? Mm. So. And that sort of goes on to a really good point um, that I want to sort of open as well is that, the self-awareness, like obviously going through adjustments and all that, like I know within myself, I learned a lot about myself. And um, people often say to me, well, how did you get through what you did? Um, what have you? And I don't have an answer. It's like, well, I don't know. I just did. Um, but, you know, dealing with things like motivation, lack of motivation, dealing with the change, 
did people on the panel, um, I guess, surprise yourself if you were able to get through? And going through that, did you learn a lot about yourself and your own resilience and your own ability to deal with adversity and adjustment? Look, I think I, I did have to push myself in the early years, you know, but, uh, and, you know, I would make excuses, but they were also legit too, you know, like I might have not been feeling great or didn't want to be around people or it might have been too cold or all of those things, but I was, it was like that at home anyway. Like I was cold and sitting at home, so why not go out if I was invited or why not turn up to an event? And, you know, it was like that anyway, so you might not have a, a day and be out and grow and be part of it. So, you know, that was for me in the early days, you know. I realised um, that, well, you know, it all, yeah, I will look at that. Mm. Awesome. Now, I, I'm going to tie this in. Now, this is, um, I know when we were setting this up, this sort of topic created a bit of discussion between, I guess, Pete and myself. We talk about hindsight. Um, and I might throw to Lynn initially on this one to explain your principle. So when you were working with people, you, uh, I won't explain it too much, but you use the number 43. So I might get you to ex elaborate on that and then we'll throw to the panel. So uh, when I say I was a teacher, I was a, a science teacher. And so people talk about finding the uh, silver lining. So the atomic number or the number of, of silver is 43. So I talk about number 43s. And so in any situation that I find myself in, I try and find a silver lining. I try and find a number 43. So um, for example, I work with Sal Hofsking, amazing person. There's a number 43. I've played basketball with Catherine Reed. Um, great person, loving mum, incredible enthusiasm and en energy that I can take a bit from. There's a number 43. Uh, the people that, that I've met, um, I, uh, where I live to get exercise, I've got a hand cycle and I take my dog down to the dog park. And the number of kids who will ride past me and say, like I said before, I'll look in the aisle, I'll say, say hi and I'll smile at them. And the kids go, oh, what a cool bike. And to me, that's a number 43. So I, the little things, but it's the little things that give me the greatest pleasure. Awesome. And I, I guess just to clarify, when I say Pete and I had a bit of discussion about this, is we all lived with spinal injuries for a period of time and we can see, I guess, the, with the benefit of hindsight, those positives. Um, but for people out there, and think back to when you guys were in rehab, and for people out there going through their initial stages of their injury, hearing people like myself, Lynn, Josh, et cetera, saying, oh, look, there's going to be all these opp potential opportunities out there. We might just tell them, look, we're not interested. We're going through our own adjustment. Um, so I guess with the benefit of hindsight, were you, was anyone on the panel like that? Were they were really reluctant to hear, look, I don't care about what you've achieved in a wheelchair. I'm not interested in that because I'm going through my own but also, I guess, potential opportunities that have come out of um, ending up paralysed or things that you may not have done. So obviously, Nas and Josh, you know, Paralympians, et cetera. Um, I know my life definitely took a change. You know, even Jeff with his art. Um, I guess, does anyone want to share their thoughts on opportunities that have come out of ending up paralysed? Yeah, I can, I can remember if I was watching this when I was in rehab, I'd be like, um, please switching off. Because um, for the first 12 months, I, I didn't really want to speak to anybody, any person that was in a wheelchair. Um, but then I sort of look at it a bit differently. Like there's, there's no choice. Like it, uh, I, I guess it is what it is in many ways. You know, it's black and white in that sense. And uh, my life before was another chapter. There's another chapter that I'm making the most of uh, my opportunities. And uh, you alluded to that a bit earlier than Becky. Yeah, so with me, like um, when I was first injured, I did hear about, you know, people in the first few years, I, I'd meet, and they'd say things like, oh, you know, breaking my neck has changed my life, being a better person, and those sort of hindsight quotes, 
that used to annoy me. And um, I think, oh, where are they going with that? You know, you know, if you put the shoe on the other foot, it, it doesn't stick. And I, but it took me a while to see that. You know that there is a lot of opportunities, and you need to grab opportunities when they go past you, or make opportunities, or make luck and grab it, and don't let it go past you. It, and um, now some of those opportunities, I like the sound of them, but I knew it was going to be a big commitment, and whether I could do it, and whether I could get up early enough, or whether I was strong enough, or whether I had the energy to do it the whole day. And no, I didn't at the start, but. Growing with it, I did. You know, now I'm uh, you know, involved in many clubs and community things and stuff that, but I, you know, it surprised me how much time I can give it. But at the start, it was really hard. You know, um, to get up at 6 a.m. every morning to do everything I do in a day. But now it's part of my life. I'm really glad I have taken those opportunities to do those things. Yeah. Awesome. Does anyone else want to share anything? There, I guess. Uh, I mean, my, my big hindsight sort of realization, you know, five years on from my injury was that, and, and it sounds really cliche and it probably won't stick with many people, but you can be whoever you were before your injury, post injury. And mm. I, it took me a long time to realize that because I think people were always telling me all these opportunities, you know, join wheelchair basketball or whatever. And that just didn't resonate with me. That wasn't. I wasn't a sporty person beforehand. So all those things were kind of like, I don't want to be that person that all the things that everyone was telling me I should do. It's a long time for me to feel, to feel like I could just, I could be the same person. I didn't have to do anything different because I was in a wheelchair. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something important. If you just want to live a regular life, um, then that's, that's a great achievement as well. Like just doing it, as you say, doing what it is you were before your injury. Mm-hmm. Like there's no nothing necessarily stopping you, Sal. Sorry, yeah, Becky. Some nice words of wisdom on here that uh, I think I believe it was Pete that told me. It's you no, know, um, there was a period of time where I was Josh that had a spinal cord injury. Then it's just Josh living with a spinal cord injury. So I think there's there's a period where uh, an individual goes through that journey and comes to that thinking. Yeah, wise words. And I guess just to add to that too, from my point of view of supporting people, um, like when they've hit those points where they're feeling that they're not getting ahead or those goals and things like that, then what you've just mentioned, Sally, I think is really key. It's that whole thing around recognising actually all those strengths that you have, you still have them. You know, some of them might not be as strong at that point, but they're part of who you are and they're part of your personality and what made you you know, get to where you are at that point. So, um, and sometimes people just need a gentle reminder if, if they're struggling to see that or, um, yeah, so I totally agree. And um, I think going forward for some people that I've supported um, has also been looking at the quality of relationships they've had with people. And that to some people has been really enhanced through the process of adjusting into a new place in their life um, and actually having much stronger connections with people as well. So. Um, I think it's important to, even though having a spinal cord injury is certainly you wouldn't wish it on anyone. And uh, um, it's important to realize that, that even people without spinal cord injuries, everyone's got it, got problems in their lives and, and, and some people's problems are different to mine, but not necessarily any easier or harder. Um, even within spinal cord injured people, some people are paraplegic, some are quads. Um, everyone's got different issues that they have to deal with. Some issues that I deal with, others don't have to. And some things that I don't have to deal with, people who are paraplegics have to deal with it. And, uh, I don't think any of us wish it upon somebody else, but somebody with um, a mental illness or or um, something like uh, uh, MS or or motor neurone disease or something like that, they've got it pretty tough as well. And uh, uh, you know, even everyday things for some people are, are hard to deal with. So, but, yeah. But following on that as well, something I talk about with people is sometimes a person's spinal injury is the least of their worries. 
they might be having so many other things happening in their life. So they may have relationship problems, they may have family members, they're unwell. So the actual spinal injury itself sort of takes a back seat. That it's like, well, it's a spinal injury, I'm living with it. But like, you know, they may have, like I said, other issues going on in their life um, that are then, I guess, having an impact on them. And I know that's definitely been the case with myself, um, which is really um, important. I guess I just want to throw to the panel. Um, so we've talking about adjusting, what have you. Was there anything that gave people more, I guess, angst, like things like finding carers? We've spoken a little bit about bladder and bowel, you know, the adjustment of that. Things like housing. Was there anything that you know, in your own sort of um, life that you found a really difficult part to adjust and how you got over that and how you did adjust? I found it really hard to give up teaching. Um, yeah. I found, I find uh, the classroom incredibly joy, um, a joyous thing to do. It's really satisfying to see kids develop over the 12 months you're with them. So having to give that up was really, really tough. So one of the things that I did was to volunteer myself. Um, I was working with a couple of different physios uh, at the time. One of them happened to be uh, or hold a leadership position within the Australian um, Physiotherapy Association, and they wanted to update their teaching materials uh, for aquatic physiotherapy. So I offered to do that. And so for a couple of years, twice a week, uh, I'd go to the hospital, find out what the physio wanted me to do, then head off to the library um, and do that. And then since they're coming into the role of peer support, I've found that I can use many of the skills that I had as a teacher in passing on information to uh, people with newly acquired injuries. And I find that incredibly um, rewarding as well. I guess on that as well, do you obviously you say you miss teaching, but do you find a similar satisfaction in what you're doing now that you, because you found that and you've, I guess, replace teaching in somehow? Do you, do you miss it as much? Like, if, do you feel that if you didn't find something that you would still miss teaching? I, I still miss teaching because there's uh, a bit of a difference from talking to talking to one-on-one -on -one where someone really wants to hear what you've got to say, and that is rewarding, uh, versus 25 year nine students who just want to tell you, well, you know, you can take a hike. Um, and to be able to take that, say, group of Year 9 students um, and have them at the end of the year respecting each other and res respecting me, um, then that's a great challenge. Or maybe Year 12 students all passing their VCE subject. So I, I, guess... I don't get the same kind of feedback as, um, as you do in teaching. So we've just had a question come in on the Q&A, Lynn, about teaching. Was there any, I guess, anything that made you stop the teaching? Because they make the point that uh, there are teachers in chairs. Was there anything individual to you, I guess, why you decided to stop teaching overall, even though there are teachers in chairs? Uh, yeah, I did go back to teaching. So it was 12 months after my injury. And uh, teachers at the time were teaching about 24 out of 30 periods in the week. Um, I was trying to do three on a return to work program and I was just exhausted. So I had a lot of things on my plate at the time as I was explaining before. There was the, um, uh, I'd been widowed in my accident. I was living with my sister and her family. I hadn't been able to get back to my family. I was dealing with a lot of appointments, um, particularly because of my amputation. And I think the amputation, I, I was quite sick uh, due to the whatever bugs got into my system um, from my leg being injured. And I, I just wasn't physically up to it. Um, well, during the 12 months that I was off, the rules changed. 
And if uh, someone had applied for a temporary disability pension, which I had, you could only hold that for two years. And at the end of those two years, you had to decide, uh, did you want to take a contract for the number of days you could work? I would have been lucky to do two. Uh, and or go on to a permanent disability pension that would be paid for the rest of your life. So my decision was mainly financial, um, going on to a disability, a permanent disability pension, because I would have gone from being, uh, you know, assistant principal level back to an expert teacher. I would have gone from an ongoing position to a contract position. I knew that contract positions were the first to go when they were looking at uh, reducing staff. So it, it was basically a, a practical mm -hmm. and a financial decision. Awesome. All right, so I might just um, let people out there watching know that um, if you wanna ask some questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A. So as we're coming towards the end of this, please, you can know, if there's something you want to ask any of the panel members that I can throw to, um, and we'll start taking questions or just raise your hand and um, we'll be happy to take questions as well. So I guess as we're coming towards the end of the session, I might just do a loop around the panel um, and just sort of ask you, you know, guys, what it is that, you would say to people about the biggest thing about your own mindset of living with the spinal injury and how it is on a daily basis that um, you just deal with it, I guess, because, you know, we all deal with it. We're all out there. We're being active um, and we're living, you know, as, as fairly normal lives as we can. I guess just the mindset of what it is um, that you think of, or if you don't think about it, anything at all, like I know something I say, it's like, well, I don't, mention a spinal injury sometimes unless it's pointed out to me because I'm so busy doing other stuff that I don't even think about it sometimes. Um, so I, I guess we'll go around and we'll start with Josh. And like I said, if anyone wants to throw in some questions, just um, refer it through the Q and A. So Josh. Um, yeah, I, I guess there's a little bit in there, but just um, like yourself, uh, Antonio, that um, I guess to understand that, early on for rehab or, you know, this, everyone has their own individual journey. Um, but I know for myself, I came to a, a thinking where this is just part of my life now. And uh, it's a, not even a really a second thought. And, uh, you know, I live an enjoyable and happy life. And um, I guess I don't really consider it a, a limiting factor. And, um, and I've just gone out there and attacked the world as best I can. Cool. So we've had a, before we continue, we've had a question come in. Um, did any panelists struggle with organising funding or equipment um, when they were initially leaving rehab? So I guess, was that a consideration for people with adjusting? Yeah. Look, I think that's always going to be a journey and um, explaining our situation to funding bodies and proving that and getting that backed up by OTs, physios, doctors, whatever it is. Um, you know, it's always taxing on the person because there's a lot of work to do with that. But um, it's part of the process and see it as a system and go with it. And, you know, of course, you'd like to get that equipment sooner rather than later, but just work within the system and get to know the system. You know, you owe, you owe yourself to learn it and get into it, get involved. And, and um, you know, don't take it too seriously because it doesn't always work out great, but you work with it and you learn and get better and better and better. At it, you know, and uh, in working that system. Well, while we've got you there, Pete, thank you for answering that. Do you just want to, I guess, give your thought, final thoughts on what was it discussed? Yeah, for me, it's probably just always adapting. You know, um, you know, from when I first injured myself, um, you know, I had lost less ability, um, and I am fairly disabled being C four five five, and and I don't think I am. Sometimes I don't think I am. So because I do a lot, I get involved, I get out, I do things, I'm involved in a lot of clubs, I've got a lot of friends, um, and I get out there, and I really encourage people to do the same. At the start, it was hard, I sort of didn't want to do it, but, and I gave myself excuses not to, but that snowballed and got bigger, and, I, and more things happened, and, and I got 
busier and busier and and top struck that balance that I really like. So just adapt, learn about your um, your ability, and get out there and do things. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, we'll just go around the screen then. So Catherine, if there's anything you want to add or say? Um, I suppose just the fact that um, it does get easier. Um, for the most part, I don't have to really think about the fact that I'm in a wheelchair from a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I suppose the most, one of the, one of the big examples for me is I can remember that the hardest thing, the scariest thing I had to learn in rehab was how to transfer onto the toilet. And I was in tears every day during physio trying to learn that it just scared me so much. And I can get up in the middle of the night now and transfer into my chair and onto the toilet and do a catheter and be back in bed before I've even really registered that I'm up. Um, like it's become so automatic to me that I second nature. So there can be things that are really hard and really scary in rehab. And in all likelihood, you're gonna get down the road and then one day turn around and go, actually, I can do that without thinking about it now. And it's not, yeah, and it's, it's, it doesn't necessarily hold you back in the way it might feel early on like it's going to. Awesome, thank you. Um, Sal? Yeah, I'm just listening and reflecting, I guess, and um, from a point of view of just trust yourself. You know, we all we all experience emotions and we all, as we said earlier, we all have strengths and don't, I, I guess, it's always about encouraging not to feel that fear of asking support or reaching out if you need it as well, but also trust that you, your inner strengths are there too. So... Awesome. Um, thank you. So, Lynn? I think I've got three. The, the first one would be to, uh, to stay as fit as you can, because I think being fitter, everything goes more smoothly, everything goes quicker. The second thing I'd say was do things that you enjoy, have some fun. Um, and the third would be, and it's usually with the people that you do these fun things, is talk to them. Bring them along with you for your journey. I find the people that have been my friends and, and stayed close friends throughout the 15 years, they don't, don't worry me at all. They give me great comfort. But if I was to go back and uh, see a teacher that I haven't seen in those 15 years, there can often be that awkwardness. And so my, my good friends, they know, um, they know all the ins and outs. And if any of those ins become outs when they shouldn't, then that's okay. And we're all cool about it. Awesome. Um, all right, so Jeff, if you just want to give your thoughts, I guess. Oh, yeah, I agree with what everyone else has been saying. I, th I think it's important that, uh, that you understand there's, there's always going to be problems crop up um, constantly and uh, there's usually a solution somewhere. You just need to find it. Um, everybody's got problems, whether they're disabled or not. And yeah, you just go through the roller coaster of life and deal with things as they come. Sometimes you can be in a real low point and then you never know when a, a high point might not be just right around the corner. So you just keep riding the roller coaster and, and usually there's something positive happens after something not so good. Awesome. Okay, Sally? Um, just to kind of repeat what I said before, it, it, whatever you did beforehand, there's a way of doing it now and, and you can be the same person. And, and like everyone has said, I think for the most part, you don't, on a day-to-day -day basis, I don't think of myself as disabled or I don't even notice the wheelchair until I think, like you said, Antonio, someone points it out and then you're like, oh yeah, I'm, yeah, that's the thing. You kind of just ignore it for the most part. It takes a while to get there, but you find a new normal and, and yeah, life goes on. And last but not least, Nas. Oh, again, thank you, Antonio. I thought yeah. I'd throw it in because you yeah. uh, reacted so well last time. So, yeah, no, no, 
I mean, uh, I'll just think, like, um, none of us are in a wheelchair because we want to be, you know. I mean, we, we can't do things exactly the way we used to do, but just like Sally said, doesn't mean you can't do what your love was before, you know. It might be in a different way. You need to work out the path to get back into it. I know, you know, when I was talking about when I returned back home from rehab, I uh, wasn't doing anything, but what I found I needed to do was the bare minimum. And the bare minimum, minimum was to get outside, you know, go around the block, stuff like that. Just just get me doing something and thought about what my interests were because your interests don't go away. So you figure out what your interests are and how to get back into them. I think that's really important. And talking and seeing what other people do as well. You might not have the same interests or be able to do what other people are doing, but I think it's a great idea to talk to other people that have got, um, you know, um, issues like with spinal cord injury. Uh, all of us guys are available, I'm sure. You know, if anyone wants to speak to us, just talk through where they're at at the moment. I mean, we'd love to hear that. So, uh, yeah, encourage people to get in contact with us, you know, if they're stuck. Because, yeah, we can help them along, you know, describe our path, our journey along the way. Awesome. Thank you. So before we wrap up, we've had one last question come in and I'll throw to all panellists that want to answer. Uh, what is your favourite area, suburb, uh, that you find really good for accessibility that's flat? Um, any Q-Ludes venues and what, have it, and what have you. So is there any particular area which any of the panellists really enjoy going that they find quite accessible? I live in a really... Sorry, Jeff. I live in a really accessible area, which is um, just in the west uh, along the the bay. The, um, the the whole area is quite flat. It's quite quiet um, on the side roads. And then there's a bike path that goes um, from Williamstown down to Werribee. It's quite wide. It's flat. It's all concrete. And I find that a great way to push. I was going to say, um, depending on what level sort of disability you have, um, some people in push chairs um, or walking frames or whatever um, can get into places um, more easily than, say, me in my motorised chair. But then again, I can um, I can power down the street in uh, fifth gear and go a lot faster than anybody else. So you get there quicker. Uh, get up hills and, uh, and things. So I have the advantage in that sense. So I can, I can get on a train and be in the city in, in no time. I think it's handy to live near a railway station for me. And uh, it's one right across the road. And I deliberately got an apartment near the railway track so I could uh, get out and about really easily. So we've had on the chat that Daniloquin is uh, really flat <laughs> apparently, so. Yeah. I think it's great though. Great photo. I will throw in internationally. Amsterdam's really flat, but watch out for the cyclists. They don't care that you're in a wheelchair. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> Very good. Cool. All right. Well, on that, I'd like to thank all the panelists for participating, as well as everyone that's logged in um, and watched. If you have any further questions, I guess address them to Spire AQA. I'm sure the peer support team be more than happy to take any questions. Um, so thank you. Or they're not there. Yeah, thank you everyone. It was a good session. Nice work, Vicky. Thank Thanks, you. People.